So, yep, that's me. I'm the guy who wrote the books. Uh, and there will be an author's table tomorrow. There's a, specifically, if you want to get an autograph, I'll be there at lunchtime. So, I am here uh, to talk about how we at Regent University integrate Security Onion into our, into our industry-facing and academic programs. I kind of have that, who's the power user in the room? That's, that's the thing I have this year. Last year, I talked about building security use cases and all the details that it takes to do that. Um, and this year, I want to really want to talk about how we use this tool for red team, blue team, purple team, and white team assessment. So when you're engaging and you want to actually do adversary simulation, the first thing I have to tell you about that is if you're following a, an organization you may have heard of called Gartner, they use the term adversary simulation. They have, they've just produced research on this. Anton Shavoykin, who's a colleague, has published it. They're talking about automated tools that test your security posture, what you've paid for. That's what they're talking about. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about real life simulations that actually function like a real red team, function like a real blue team, have an independent assessor and an auditor function because when you come to my class, I want you to walk out of my class to be changed. So in a, in a nutshell, our range environment has multiple classroom networks that are isolated from each other, completely virtualized, all rinse, wash, repeat, we can reset scenarios, and we actually require that you write a incident response report at the end. I will tell you that if you want to do internal red, blue, purple, white, green exercises, um, I have seen measurable improvement over a four-day period by actually just asking people to write things down. We've seen people go from talking in ultra geek speak, you'd swear they were reading off the book, off Chris's book, that's Chris Sanders, off his packet three book, to actually phrasing things in a manner where they say, the adversary was capable of getting into the environment because of a weakness in the system. Instead of saying things like, IP address 1 and 9203.1.4 executed an SQL query against the OX top 10 and did this, blah, blah, blah. We have measurable improvements. So we really work on this. Our range environment has roughly 15 VLAN segments and IP address ranges, and it's all virtualized and it's all self contained. So as you're looking at this being security onion aficionados, I want to say, there are dozens of places to monitor. There are dozens of things that you can monitor. And there's dozens of things that you can achieve as educational outcomes. And I'm actually going to go through and show you how we use SO in the range. And if all goes well, I'll show you some really cool stuff. Uh, just an idea of the kind of scenarios that we can execute. And I'm going to dig into a few of these and show you how Security Onion is a game changer for us. Red, blue, white, orange, we do it all. A lot of these things are very well tightly scripted. Several of them take hours to run. However, uh, it was a commercial platform, and we bought it, and it was missing something. Uh, show of hands, actually show of groans. How many of you have bought a quarter million dollar product only to find out it didn't do the one thing you wanted it to do? Yes, for those of you listening at home, we had audible noise changes in the room. So essentially, we didn't have the ability to use Snort. Wasn't there. We didn't have the ability to do full packet capture wasn't there. We didn't have NFAT. Now, if you've ever looked at Moloch, Moloch rocks. But if I have to deploy Moloch in my environment to do network forensics analysis and uh, NFAT type functionality, I got to learn a new platform. I got to teach kids, I mean, attendees a new thing. And I got to maintain a different OS. And I have to learn it. I don't have that kind of time. So in walks SO import PCAP a wonderful little utility, Richard Baitlick talked about it earlier this year, that actually turns the onion into an NFAT environment. And if I have time, or if you want to see me at a break, I can actually show you one of our exercises where we use SO as an NFAT platform. A, a few acronyms to toss out there to make sure you're acronym compliant. So our use cases really get down to looking at different segments, doing flow analysis, pulling data out, looking at real information on the wire, being able to do TCP dump, being able to use T-Shark, uh, and actually you know, use the tools that are built into the system in order to augment the default scenarios that we have. The way we actually run these in order to achieve really measurable outcomes 
is we run the default scenario where the attendee digs through lots of Windows log data, Windows event log. They do it the hard way. And then I kick it up a notch. I put a little bit of bam on it if you've been, ever been in New Orleans. And I have them actually use real tools. I mean Security Onion to solve problems. Because let me tell you, digging through the Windows event log the hard way is less than fun. So what I want to walk through is give you some idea of what we do from an attacker perspective, some of the open source tools that we actually use. If you've never heard of this tool, it's pretty neat. Uh, it was created by a guy in uh, the Netherlands, I believe, called the Blue Team Training Toolkit. And what he put together, and I can't pronounce his name, but I wrote it up there for you. What he put together is simulated exercises that mimic and function just like real malware with, with code generators that actually generate real packets. So in our case, we can bring his tools up, we can run packet captures, we can run execut executables, and he has a variety of EXEs that, because of MD5 hash some collisions, will actually be detected as real pieces of malware. So if you wanted to integrate an uh, enterprise debt enterprise desktop response or an EDR package that, that did MD5 hash analysis, or if you want to use Sysmon and actually see real hashes that you can then feed into the NSRL database, a few more acronyms if you're not acronym challenged in this industry, you can achieve that goal. It took me four and a half hours to read the doc, download the thing, turn the thing on, figure out how to make the thing work, figure out how to make the slides, and then actually rehearse the presentation. So in an afternoon, I got this puppy up and running. Oof. So some examples, some of the code that he uses, you go ahead and compile it, build the executable uh, Python code. I know Mark will be happy. So you can actually execute that, drop it off on a machine. All you really have to do is to take the Python code, put it somewhere. If you can take Python code and put it somewhere, where can you put it? You can put it in an installer. You can put it in initd. You can put it in another package. You can put it in someone's bash home file. You can change an alias. You can rewrite your own LS, which is a tool that you probably execute in the first five seconds of logging onto a machine. And you can do a lot with this. And that's what we've done. So if you actually want to look at this on the wire, and I, this is a, a execution trace of the default rule set as supplied with 16.04.0 whatever 05 is, the one that was downloaded about two months ago, actually detects this little Havoc's Trojan. So the default rule set actually detects this with a squeal. So the neat thing about this is I can take that trace and with one click, I can take a student who's never seen these tools and techniques before and I can explain to them by using an intrusion detection functionality and using what our creators have created with a right-click integration, you can pivot directly into all of this great, well-organized flow data and all of your NIDS data, and then from there you can further explore. And by the way, if you'd like to know what it costs and what it looks like if you let the little beastie run for a day, I wouldn't want to say who did that, but that's actually what it looks like. So we can actually use that exercise and kick off one of these things the day before, so when students come back for the range the next day, they can see a Trojan that has been running all night long. All night long. And then they can actually, I'm trying for best joke and show. Um, and then they can actually see this and then go historically look and see when the event occurred so they can drag on out and get to patient zero. How hard is it for you to take a junior person that you've worked with, because I see enough gray hair like me in the room, and teach them the habit of finding patient zero. Has anybody found that to be a five minute thing? Okay, for those of you at home, there was some additional laughter in the room. There's a number of free open source tools out there where you can take this model and leverage it to your heart's content. We use four, APT Simulator, Atomic Red Team. Uh, by the way, I'll talk about these tomorrow at the, uh, at the B-Sides event. So in marketing, we call that a hook. So it's kind of get you to come to that event too. There's a number of platform tools that can really be helpful. If you've never actually looked at OpenSock.io, um, Chris, whose last name, again, I can't pronounce, he's actually put together a bunch of packages and with a complete SOC solution, and he kind of spells it out for you what those tools in, entail. Really, really neat stuff. 
So I want to walk you through an example, and I want to make sure that you know that our goal is to help you learn all the things. I had to have a meme, and I thought that was a good one. So for the setup here, uh, for the setup for this particular meme, I have to walk back over here and read my, read my screen. Uh, this one is the attacker finds a portion of a website that was vulnerable to SQL injection. So in our, in our normal range scenario, the sim gives you an alert, you track it down, you chase it through the weeds, you find out that someone modified the SQL server and they're running PowerShell commands, and from there you pin it down to the source IP address, which is the web server. So the habit from the default range scenario is go here, go here, go here, draw a picture, create a graph on the wall so you have action, 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 and how you go from A, B, C. We rerun that scenario, and I get a snort alert. And I get that snort alert, and I see that this act, once again, provided default out of the box, just works. I love it. And I see that snort alert, and then I can go click into this individual snort alert, and the data is all there readable in the platform. So the student is getting exposed to and using a really powerful tool from day one. We can then proceed and pre precisely pivot to the PCAP, working on my alliteration, pull the data out of there, and since you know, it's delivered in clear text, we can actually go see the command. And then the student can then go look and validate on the web server and see when that ran. They can actually do that. So we can then pull the packet out, and you've got all of the data on the left-hand side kind of squunched down, so you can see that the system helps me see this information as a large group of data, and then I can go pull out the individual traces and validate that that is a true SQL injection. Now, I reformatted that a little bit for the slide. I don't think uh, Wes and Doug have built in a pretty formatter for SQL injections to Security Onion, but if they do, it might look like this. Then we can also use other tools in the distribution built in and see when events occurred on a cluster basis, because the more things that occur around time for a given cluster, the more stuff you have to investigate. And these are all of the additional pieces of activity that the system found for that address for the default scenario that we ran it through. So it's very much an augmentative, enhancing learning experience for us. And besides, not only that, you can make a swanky diagram. I think that sounds cooler than a swanky diagram, and it looks nicer too. So for us, we have students go and pull this information out because this kind of a visual communicates a lot better than a TCP dump output to anybody when you're trying to explain the nature of what happened particularly if you want to have a visualization that at a given point in time, you can go back and say, this occurred, these systems are involved, so you can get that relationship and pull that down to find out who spoke with whom. We have another example, web defacement. Again, because we want to learn all the things. So how do we use this? How do we use Security Onion for this tool? An attacker attacked the network, uh, defaced a website, got in by a SSH brute force attack, um, I actually really had this happen, by the way. And let me tell you a story. We had a guy, and we're gonna, I'm going to call him Bob. And Bob was tar charged with replacing the VoIP system, the H323 gateway. And Bob had the brilliant idea of taking the old system out of production and putting the new system in at the same old IP address because he thought that would work great because he already had the NAT translation in place. Bob made one mistake. Bob did that before he hardened the box. I found the box because I had 383,000 failed attempts against SSH in a 90 minute period from China and one success. And I went into Bob's office and I said, Bob, what are you doing? Uh, why are you here? People didn't like me when I walked into their office because I was the security dude, and I mean, always was bad news. Anybody had that showing show of hands? Again, for those of you at home, more laughter in the room. Um, and, you know, Bob knew it was going to be a bad day, and I said, so, Bob, and I bounced up and down. I said, so you're giving your server to China? And he's like, no, I'm not. I said, yeah, you are. So if you think that something like this is a little contrived, at least in my professional experience, it is not. So once again, Squeal to the rescue, and the snort rule set to the rescue. You can actually pick that up, and uh, I know you can't read that, so I made a little call out. That's the default rule set as supplied out of the box, didn't have to tune it one. We'll pick up the potential SSH scan, so this becomes an augmentative experience. I can then go 
and have my students go look at the actual packet capture trace, see the trail, see who's talking to who, so they can get exposed to the idea of, of doing real packet level analysis and actually finding this data. Then the magic happens. Click, click, right click. Are you ready? Isn't that cool? So seriously, this is a real question. If you've ever made a mistake transposing an IP address from one system to the next, groan loudly. All right, that's a groaner joke. Um, I do this, I've done this probably every day. So for me, in the, in the process of making sure that you walk through a scenario and an exercise and we maximize your time, by having right-click integration of going straight from one information system, from the snort squeal interface and all the things and the goodness that it provides, going right into the Kibana interface and being able to show that picture within, I mean, it's like four seconds on the watch. So now we can go see two from relationships that have to do with that address, some idea of protocol, some idea of volume metrics. And these things are particularly valuable for us because trying to do that with pulling data out of PCAP logs, I'd have to go talk to Mark because I think he's got a plan, right? He had better results than I would have. So those are kind of two real life stories of how we actually use the tool uh, to augment the learning experience. But we also use the tool to make sure that we can deploy the tool correctly. Because as I showed you earlier, I have 15 or 16 network segments, and I want to be able to deploy Security Onion on all those segments times four classrooms. Um, if I deployed Security Onion on all those individual segments in four classrooms, how many virtual machines would I be running? 16 times four, and somebody do the math on that. I'm getting old, so I don't know but it's more than 10. At 100 gigabytes of storage times you know, 60 some odd machines, that's you know, 600 gigabytes of storage. That's a lot of storage. And what happens if they run out of room? Students fail, labs fail, student doesn't have a good experience, tool isn't shown very good, let's, let's make this work gooder. So the first thing I did was I, uh, I, I fired up the machine and I filled up my disk, and it's like, I am bad, 85%. I'm not capturing data. Why is that? I did this during the day, by the way. So Security Onion has a variety of pruning scripts and things to tell you when you're having problems. Uh, I, I kind of I, I got over that pretty quick because I had a lot of data coming in. So I looked at it, and I said, the visualization tab, what can it do to help me? Oh, there's over 380 visualizations, something like that, built in. Even eight for Modbus, really cool stuff. So I went in there and I said, how, how are these connections gonna help me? Oh my gosh, I got the big green there. The big green is doing a whole lot of work. The big green is generating a lot of data. That's my most heavy consumer. In my range, can I get rid of that? Can I make that go away? Let's go find out. You all wanna find out? You wanna know the story? And then to be, to be a little bit diligent, I said, well, who else is going along? Or should I go work, look for anybody else in the same process, put a couple of eliminations in there, continue to dig down, do my long tail analysis, and find out that I really have to deal with my heavy hitter. So I go look at my heavy hitter, and I love the fact that you've got right click, you just hover over and you get all kinds of really cool bits of data. Lots of data being consumed here for a short period of time. Uh, if you do the math on that, if I, was, if I did not put this issue under control, because uh, this was like an hour's worth of period or something like that, I would quickly run out of space in my range 60 times over in my environment, and I would not be able to use the tool effectively the way I want. So we go look at our suspect. Again, you click right on the, um, that little, uh, the, 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 the Zeek con connection number in, on all those little funny letters. You go right to it, right to the address, and I can find out, bing, this guy is talking to that guy, and what exactly are they doing? So I have a huge amount of data from two machines on a network, big talkers. So I go right there, you can use the, the addresses, the connection ID is hugely valuable to pin that down to what time it was, range starts up, a lot of activity going on, and I went down here, and I did a little bit of TCP dump magic, it's my favorite tool, I have gray hair, it's my go-to tool, but this doesn't really give me a good picture, but it does tell me a lot of stuff is going on port 445. So I use this other tool. 
Now, are you reading the text in the red? I figured of all the audiences that would appreciate the typo, you guys would appreciate the typo. You know, I, I showed it to Mark earlier. I thought he was going to stop breathing and laugh so hard. So you go fire up some TCP shark on it, and you get a better idea and a better picture, and you sure enough, you find that this is SMB traffic. We dig into it. We take action on it. What we find out is, you know, dot three and dot one are the SIM platform and the domain controller. You've ever worked with a SIM platform that pulls Windows logs? It is munchy. It gets all kinds of data really fast, does a rinse, wash, repeat, and I can't have that in my range because that's going to fill up my disks. And it's, more importantly, I can't safely produce a week's worth of data for longitudinal analysis against 15 scenarios with these kind of numbers. I have to solve for that problem. Enter BPF filters. Now, as you look at this, my use case for using this particular filter in the manner that I did is unique to my environment. I would make sure that if you're going to wholesale stop traffic from two machines, which is what that filter does, you have a darn good reason for doing it. But in my case, because it's the SIM and I have all kinds of data in the SIM, that's okay for me. If you're going to use this in the real world, you'd really want to go look at the granular BPF filtering guidance on the wiki and figure out what you want to get rid of. But it was not very hard to do this, and I got a lot of data. Graphically speaking, this is the volume change. You turn this filter on, and it's like uh, flat. That means with just that one filter, I can get a week's worth of data six, six or seven days longitudinally for all of my scenarios, because they all come from the same attacker, and I can tell a story when I get done with the exercises. So you got to kind of figure out how much you can store in your environments. These techniques are very, very valuable. Uh, SO stat will give you a pretty good idea of what's going on, but it didn't take me to the level that I wanted because I really didn't have a neat way of finding out how much data I had on an individual day. Again, a few minutes of scripting, because I've done this before, having to defend the sim running out of trim. I had a pretty good habit. This is maybe 60 lines of, of shell code. And then I get this breakdown here that tells me this is how much data I'm storing on a given daily basis. So again, that becomes a learning out output for me. If we're talking with students or we're trying to get trainees to understand about data consumption and making data decisions, we can actually explain to them this activity occurred on this day and this is how much you can store. Now, I have a really, really cool story to share with you. Uh, I'm out of time. Do I have 10 minutes? Yeah. 10 minutes. So, I really, really, really want to get my Palo Alto data into Security Onion. I mean in a big way. Because I own a Palo Alto at my house. I've worked with them. I'm not an expert, but I'm a real fan. I'm a, quite a fan of them. And there is a Palo Alto cult out there if you've never actually met this. And I think I'm an acolyte, but I like it. And it's got some really sophisticated out-of-the-box dashboard tools. This is kind of a heat map of data storage and connection counts. And that's, that's pretty dense. That's feature dense in what that shows you. Yeah, yeah, that was my, uh, I have, a, I have a, a person at home called a teenager. You ever heard of these creatures? It's great. I, I, a TCP shark doesn't get a laugh, but teenager jokes gets audible in the room. I love it. So, hey, you know, it's open source. It can't be that hard. Two weeks later. Um, so the concept was, I, I, I went and found some code by a guy named Sam Miller, all in Elk, has beautiful dashboards. It worked for Sam. It can work for me. Sam, Don, three letters each. Good, to, I can do that. Um, plus, it's open source, and I can read it. Installed his stuff, four and a half hours. Kind of a repeat theme there. It worked. Beautiful dashboards working. Um, since I don't have user integration with my Palo Alto to a domain, the user integration stuff did not work. That's the only part that wouldn't work with Sam's code. I started going down the road. Two weeks later, posted some messages to the board. West pointed me in the right direction. Very helpful. Um, found that I wasn't going quite where I wanted. Wes helped us out. I think you put, what, three hours into it, maybe? Maybe three hours, because Wes is a bit more of an expert than I am. And with that in mind, I could actually do stuff. Wes helped me with the parser, got that squared away. And when you look at Sam's code on the left-hand side, he was using variable names with his particular naming convention based on his reading of the PanOS 8 documentation on the Palo Alto site. 
and he used these variable names. Let me tell you, oh, it's working, I love it. So you got, he used that term, uh, Wes used this term. You as a human being can read that. You can say, this is this. That's cool, I can make that. Then I can make this really cool uh, visualization right here. URL categorization based on the source data set. Then you've got, in the, uh, in the interface later on, you've got different ways to group it. So again, because I took existing viable code, worked for the subject matter expert, was actually capable of doing this. And then I produced this really, really, really cool graph. Because what this actually shows you is how much data from what machine is generating blocked traffic by day. So who's my heavy hitter? The green one. Why is the green machine generating all kinds of outbound data across an entire range that is being blocked by my Palo Alto policy based on URL categorization? Now, for fairness, I have two teenage boys. I have a variety of things that my Palo Alto blocks. You can let your mind wander to know what they are, uh, et cetera. But if you have teenage boys, you know, open DNS, Palo Alto worked really well. You know, you know, stuff like that. So not quite sure what it was. But the real point is that I can go and fill in this stuff by doing side by side of what one person is doing on one machine. And I ran into a problem. Were you guys at, at, at Doug's talk last year where he talked about stuff? He'd say, oh, there's a problem. So I had that experience. And what I found is that when we put the code together, we'd actually forgotten to mutate the, the, the numerical data into a numerical value, so you couldn't do number math on it. Okay, that took me like two minutes to fix that, but I couldn't go back and historically analyze it. So, enter in Wes. Wes has a re-index script published on his GitHub. I used it. It worked. It took an hour on my slow box. Four CPUs, 32 gigs of RAM. Uh, Xeon 8, uh, 2541, I think. I didn't quite have Mark's good luck. Um, then a little bit of modification, and then poof. Can, the reason why I knew I had to do something like this is what you don't see in this list is the word bytes. These are all the fields that are in, that are in the onion at the moment for, that are byte-based. So because I got the byte field in there on the left-hand side, and I could get that, I could actually create the equivalent functionality. To me, this is a pretty huge win and a pretty good story because we've taken uh, some open source stuff and here's where you really are with this. You have a display on the left-hand side that talks about connection counts. You have a display on the right-hand side that talks about volumetric data by applications. This may not look as pretty as the Palo Alto user interface that I showed you earlier, but does it answer the question? Yes. It effectively answers the question. I can right-click, mouse over, see individual stuff, drill into the detail, and I can actually answer the same question. So for us, as an open source community, using tools and techniques like this really help out. And these are things, Wes put a couple of hours into it, I put a couple of hours into it, was really helpful. So that's officially where I have you know, my ending point, and I think we are on time, are we not? Hot dog. So I can entertain any questions if you want. Um, by the way, I'm legally blind, so you have to wave violently if you want to ask a question. You must do this. All right, I, in the... Oh, yeah. Totally. And, oh, by the way, I asked Doug earlier, and I asked Wes, I said, well, why don't we take the Palo Alto stuff that I have and extend that out? And so we're going to end up doing that. I'm going to create about 60% of what was in Sam Miller's code, properly using all the stuff in Security Onion. So it's going to conform to the Security Onion naming data set. So the Palo Alto data. Anybody own a Palo Alto in the world? Are you part of the cult? Yeah. Wouldn't it be cool to have kind of cool-looking Palo Alto stuff in your onion box? Is that, is that of interest? Let's see a show of hands. I, I see one, two, three, four, five, you know, violent agreement group. So um, once I get my initial stuff done, uh, that will be posted back at some point. Wes and I are going to do all the cool stuff to export it and make it available. and It'll all be for you guys as well. I think I'm done. Is there any, any other questions? All right.